um, this these uh, big uh, one point five million dollar investment that you just mentioned is actually um, for three different grants in the canine comparative oncology space. And that's part of a larger investment over $5 million in this area. So we're really committed to this approach and I'm excited to tell you a little bit more about it. Um, so I don't know if, you know, almost everyone has been touched by cancer and if that happens to you or your family or someone you care about, the, the, the drug to cure them can't come soon enough. And um, that's one problem we have right now is that a lot of drugs that look really good in the early stages, say in mice or, or you know, just don't pan out in humans. Um, and part of the reason for this is because, you know, a mouse is not a human. And it's, it's, and it's when you're using a research animal, you're inducing the cancer, it's not um, spontaneous, and it's not, um, the immune system is usually not intact. They've done something to, to you know, to, or it's not a good match for um, a human situation. So as, so one thought is that, um, and I don't know if most people know this, if you've had, if you have a dog that's had cancer and you sought treatment for it, you would have talked, gone to a veterinary hospital. You would have actually had a canine um, oncologist or a radiation oncologist work with you. Um, there are clinical trials in dogs. There's all this infrastructure to take care of cancer in dogs um, that also exists on the human side. So we have this infrastructure in place um, and and so the, the thought is, why can't we work with these two, two um, patients or caring for both these types of patients in parallel? So what can we learn about clinical trials in dogs that we can apply to humans? And what have we found out about humans that can also help our, our dog patients or our pets? Um, so, and why, why, why dogs, you might ask? Well, dogs and humans are actually 85% genetically similar. So you know, even though we don't look alike, um, there's an underlying genetic similarity and that can reveal itself in a lot of different ways. So um, osteosarcoma is what I like to talk about because that's a bone cancer. And if you, if a pathologist takes a uh, tumor tissue from a human and tumor tissue from a dog and osteosarcoma, they can't tell them apart under the microscope. They are so identical. Um, other ways in which dog and human cancers can be similar is same genetic mutations. Um, cancer cells can respond to treatment the same. How cancer cells evade treatment is something that may be similar. How cancer cells become cancerous. So what are the exposures, like environmental exposures? And that's interesting with dogs because, you know, dogs and humans live together. So we might be exposed to the same um, type of carcinogens. So there's another whole avenue of treatment where, where this similarity and coexistence can be leveraged to help both species. Um, and also for diagnosis, you know, what can we learn about diagnosing a cancer in a dog that we could um, apply to human or vice versa? Um, in fact, figuring out how the first step of those similarities or first step of research, I should say, is figuring out how dog and human cancers are the same. So we funded a lot of research at the V Foundation to look at that. Um, in fact, since 2016, we've invested over $5 million in canine comparative oncology. And initially we supported um, a local program between Duke Cancer Institute, which is an NCI designated cancer center and the um, North, Carolina, um, North Carolina State uh, College of Veterinary Medicine. And uh, they've formed a consortium for canine comparative oncology or C3O. And we funded their program. And within that program, they funded you know, several dozen pilot programs to answer the question, hey, you know, we're seeing this in dog, or, you know, can we learn from this in human or vice versa? Um, just to identify which cancers are more similar and could be, could benefit from this approach, um, which is a big question, you know, because depending on, you know, it's not, it's not identical across the board. For some cancers, this is identical. That's, you know, that's different. This phase of the cancer may be more identical um, at, at, you know, in the first phase, but then by the by the time the, the cancer is metastasized, it doesn't look the same anymore. So there are a lot of understanding um, how we can help people and pets and what research will work is to figure out where those parallels lie. So that's step one. So we funded a lot of that with the C3O initiative here locally. Um, just this year in those three grants that you mentioned, um, there was a larger consortium that was funded called the Comparative Oncology Research Consortium or CORC for short. And that's actually a large, much larger partnership. It includes NC State and Duke Cancer Institute, but there are also another five partnerships across the country um, where NCI designated cancer centers already have a relationship with the veterinary hospitals. 
So, um, so we're really proud of these, the most recent grants we funded. Um, there were three $500,000 grants um, to Cork members. So um, two of them went to University of Minnesota and one went to the University of Colorado. And there, all of those three grants happened to um, be in the area of immunotherapy. Um, one of them in, in glioblastoma, which is kind of brain cancer, and the other one in bone cancer, and the third one in, in sarcoma, that should benefit sarcomas. So um, yeah, so we're excited about this approach. Um, it's, and we really hope it will accelerate drug development. Uh, another encouraging thing for us is that the FDA has started to look at these canine um, outcomes from clinical trials and starting to use that data as, okay, this looks promising enough that we'll let you start, you know, a human trial. This is, you know, on top of the mouse evidence, this dog evidence is further, you know, um, confirming for us that this is likely to work in humans. Um, well, it's, it's really high. Um, about 1 million dogs are treated for cancer every year, and cancer kills about half of the dogs that are over 10 years old, um, and about one third of the younger dogs. So it's, it's a very, maybe the most common reason that we lose our pets through cancer. Um, so yeah, it's, it's very common. Well, the promise of this approach is that it can accelerate drug development, um, shortening the time to treatments. Um, so we really think that this parallel learning from uh, human cancer research and, and canine cancer research will actually help um, both, both pets and people. Um, the other thing is since pets live you know, decades less than humans, the, the other thing we think about a lot at the Bee Foundation is survivorship. So, just because something cures you doesn't mean that you know you live happily ever after ever ha happily ever after. You can have you know long-term side effects from the treatment. Um, it could be cardiac, could be mental, all kinds of things that you don't really would rather not have. Um, so in the the thing about the dog trial, since the dog's life is so short, you you'll see a signal maybe earlier if you see a side effect in a dog. So you're going to see it months down the road, not years down the road. And that'll be like early warning that, okay, you know, we need to be aware of this. We need to figure out if we can tweak the treatment so it doesn't cause this side effect or we need to just not do this. Um, so that, that's, that's another thing. So, you know, almost every part of um, cancer treatment, diagnosis, um, prevention and long-term survival, I imagine any of those could be impacted through this approach. I mean, we have, we have funded things um, within any all of those spaces. So um, we're hopeful that this will accelerate what we can do for both um, dogs and people.